first question to you today would be, what is your take on the leadership potential and leadership development efforts as of now in India? I think uh, if I look at the Indian situation now and I look back at the last decade or so, which I've been more directly uh, sort of interacting and being in India, and I focus my uh, discussion more around business and leadership, I think there's tremendous uh, level of maturity and aggression which has come in Indian leaders who are especially, who, have, uh, who are no longer afraid of competing with the best uh, global firms. I mean, and, they are, and the aspect of innovation, for example, which requires tremendous leadership to make investments in business before events have happened, also are happening at a tremendously uh, good rate in India. And uh, I think the bright examples of those would be uh, vehicles like Nano, for example, in the automotive industry, which are really breakthrough. I think in the last uh, five to seven years, ten years, even Scorpio uh, would be a breakthrough from the Indian context, both because of its design and robustness and its ability to effectively compete with Toyota, which I think in the in the in, if you step back and looked at it 20 years back, would have been very difficult uh, sort of competitive situations to face. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, given the background of the recent global how India held its own in spite of whatever was going on in the world. What do you think should be the strategic priorities of Indian banking and financial sector in particular? I think that's, uh, I think the reason India uh, did not get hurt also reflects the fact that in some ways India is an island and there is enough level of hurdles for foreign capital to, uh, to come in. Uh, so it is in some ways insulated from the rest of the world. It does not reflect in the fact that it's really competitive. It just means it's still protected. And my own view is that uh, we should not do away with protection in a very fast, swift move. But it should be done gradually with a view to supporting Indian industry becoming competitive. So I think uh, for, from a banking sector point of view, for instance, uh, floating the rupee, I think, is, is, is a good thing. Allowing foreign debt to come in should be another step to take so that we can get advantage of lower cost financing and funding for Indian infrastructure, for instance. But any opening of the markets too suddenly, I think, will be the wrong thing because part of what we should be looking at is also to give uh, support to Indian industry, particularly the medium-sized industries, which I think in a sudden discontinuity will, will find it difficult to compete. The sector in particular which comes to mind in that sense is retail for instance. And I think my view is that, uh, that retail should be done with a view of creating maximum employment in India and for the right goods to be bought from here as opposed to paying inflated fees for brands coming from abroad. So I think the, to answer that specifically from a banking point of view, the banking policy should support a gradual move to becoming globally competitive. And I think the primary goal should be how the Indian consumer is helped, not so, how companies can make more profits. But actually, speaking more, you know, in the West, it was the other way around, how everybody could gain rather than just uh, the banking in India has been very strong on the norms and uh, legalities of it. Do you think that would be the reason why? The global recession did not hurt us that much. Well, if you look at it, I think absolutely yes. Because that is the reason now Indian banking policy is being used as, as a benchmark globally. And I think uh, not only the fact that the rules were there, but they were not played around with, I think is the key. Because if you look at some of the primary reasons for the meltdown in the West, it's because of using uh, uh, three letter words creatively and trying to look at packages of risk which were much more riskier than they would proceed to. And I think a lot of it was driven by trading greed because if you took a package of risks and you packaged it and then you could sell the same thing five times, five brokers made money in that deal. So it is actually reassuring from my point of view that Indian banking system didn't allow such uh, profit taking motives. 
and I found at least for the first year they had an advantage over me because they had done a lot of case study methodology and we had not. The other interesting fact in consulting is that a good consultant in the first 12 to 18 months does not have any bearing with your long term success in consulting. Because if you have done consulting before or you have exposure to certain skills, say finance, accounting, then by nature you will do well initially. But consulting requires a lot of stamina, it requires a lot of interest and a lot of curiosity and those are things which people develop over time. So people actually fall out of consulting very readily because only hard skills don't actually make you a good consultant. Final point in consulting is the, the ability to uh, relate to people and I think being able to ask good questions uh, the, the way you are here, is, I think is also very important for consulting. Yes. Another, another prime thing that you said is the ability to sort out the complexities from any given situation is very important. Yes. And uh, real life uh, case studies would I think so. I think that makes you more com confident and comfortable. I think not doing it doesn't mean that you cannot be a good consultant because it's a longer term assessment. But the, the start will be smoother in a consulting environment. That will be learning on the job later on. Absolutely, Absolutely, always. So I mean you can come in without much experience and still do well in consulting. But I think if you want to prepare for it, I think this is a good preparation is to go through some real life up front. And it could be an industry, I think frankly the challenges in non-profit are far higher and more difficult because the objective function is much more difficult to define. And I mean in, in business it's ultimately up to, uh, about return on investment. But in, in, in the social field to define the top and the bottom of that equation is very difficult. So I mean I would think in a situation which you are in, maybe you can get a unique edge by looking at social issues and issues of sustainability which soil sort of goes after and I think those will be extremely relevant for uh, consulting. So I don't think that it has to be a very traditional uh, uh, issue to go after. In fact, yes, that, that's one of the key ingredients when we, uh, when we have a social innovation project. So we, everything that we do in the classrooms, most of it has to be related back to the NGOs that we work with. Yeah. And I think, frankly, that is uh, more challenging than in an average business environment. So those are better defined and more contained in terms of uh, uh, the, the issues and, and the area they are playing. And I think you have more room and degrees of freedom in a business environment yeah. compared to in a social environment, which is very good. The presentation we went through earlier, for example, we wouldn't think of salt as being that critical an element in a business environment necessarily. But in solving a social issue, you have to think of those very specific details and then come up with very precise solutions. So I think you don't have to pick out where you have to fix the issue, but I think you can comprehensively fix issues and put some analytical strength behind them. I think that is very useful for the certain. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you Thank for you. your time. It's Thank been you. a privilege to have all of you share the audience with people. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.